on five switch. All right. Uh, thanks for everybody tuning in to this launch of the Second Rainbow Coalition book reading program. Uh, I'm Kwame Chase Shakur, um, one of the representatives, uh, the current uh, chairman for the Second Rainbow Coalition. Um, just a little background story about how this all started. Um, che, uh, uh, Jose Che, uh, uh, Cha -Cha, uh, uh, Cha -Cha Jimenez, uh, hit me up one day, uh, told me about uh, checking out the sec uh, the first Rainbow Coalition that was going to be shown on first uh, PBS. Uh, a lot of us already seen the first Rainbow Coalition, um, but that was like in 2021. Uh, later on that year, we end up founding uh, the Rainbow Coalition, uh, uh, May 14, 2021, in Newark, New Jersey. That was the New African Black Panther Party, White Panther Party, and Young Lords founded it. Uh, well, reestablished, you know, uh, historically it started off with the, uh, with, uh, the original Black Panther Party's April 4th, 1969, with the Young Patriots and um, uh, young uh, Patriots organization and Young Lords, and they was the first to launch this model of class struggle in this country. We refounded that again May 14, 2021. Uh, since then, we've grown. We got a lot of other members were a part of the uh, Second Rainbow Coalition. High Thurman was very fundamental in that founding, refounding, along with another elder, Andy Willis. He reached out to me and uh, linked me and Hot Thurman up, and we've been like peanut butter and jelly ever since. You know what I mean? Uh, we're about to start the book tour uh, on the East Coast, the Principal Unity book tour. We just finished that, uh, the West Coast uh, book tour up. That Principal Unity tour was successful out there in California. Uh, October of this year, uh, many of the Brown Berets came out to all of our events, supported us, did our security. So we're looking forward to the launching of this Principal Unity Tour slash East Coast Book Tour that we're, we will be jumping off uh, March 2023. <clears throat> One of the reasons why we starting off with my book, uh, My Search for Answers, Truth and Meaning, the Autobiography of Quantum and then we'll be going into uh, High Thurman's book next to read uh, Revolutionary Hillbillies. It, uh, it's for the Second Rainbow Coalition to become familiar with these uh, works that is a part of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Uh, so when we do these book tours, people are already familiar with uh, the, uh, the substance of our book. But we also going to extend after we read my book and High Thurman's book. This is going to be a permanent fixture of the Second Rainbow Coalition. We're going to start reading uh, My People Rising by Aaron Dixon. He's one of the elders that's associated with the Second Rainbow Coalition. After we finish his book, uh, he's going to come on and speak to us about being the first chapter of the original Black Panther Party outside of California. You know what I mean? So we'll have a lot of different elders come on after we read their book and we can uh, have an opportunity to discuss their book with them, ask them any questions we have. While they still here, we can take advantage of the fact that these elders can pass on a lot of wisdom and knowledge to our generation to make our generation better fit for what uh, is ahead of us going forward as the Second Rainbow Coalition. So uh, we'll be doing a lot of readings about the Young Lords, the Brown Berets, um, various different organizations about the first Rainbow Coalition. So we know our history when we are asked different questions by people about these various organizations. And it's going to build a stronger relationship between us as comrades when we know our own, uh, our, our collective history. Uh, uh, but uh, we're going to also develop in the way where we're going to start to understand uh, revolution is a science. You know, I mean, this is going to help increase our literacy, uh, our scientific analysis, our organizational skills um, in order to be equipped to make history for our generation. So these are some of the aims of the Second Rainbow Coalition book reading program. Uh, we ask that everyone come on here when we do discussions. Be polite. We got all comrades. We all are part of the same coalition. We might disagree when we have different discussions topics that come up in the book reading but just be polite uh it's not personal attacks you know what i'm saying but if you have a disagreement you can do so 
with principle, but maintain unity at the end of the day, because we all comrades in the same struggle. So with that said, every time we start these book reading program uh, sessions, we're going to start off with the statement of unity. So everyone becomes familiar with why we even came together and refounded the second rainbow coalition. You know what I mean? So with that said, if you can pull the statement of unity up, Gabriel, we'll start with that. All right, so I'm gonna start reading this. Uh, this is a preface of the Statement of Unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. Since the US was founded as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery still in the lands of the indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them and confining them to reservation and concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the eagle sunk its claws into other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its northern territory, invading Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies in the 20th century. It became the major imperialist power in the world, exploiting both the people within its borders and those in every other country bullying them with military interventions and robbing them of their right to self-determination. <clears throat> As Huey P. Newton uh, stated, we have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism. Between the two, capitalism is primary, racism is a byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the world, of every ethnicity and, or nationality, face a common enemy that is destroying life on Earth. Our enemy is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life. Food, shelter, health care, education, freedom from oppression by the state, and peace with other nations. To attain these things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance of the, uh, that it is available is shared equitably. Statement of Unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the first Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969 by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lures, and Young Patriots Organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets, Rising Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the masses have developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight back against the capitalist imperialist system in various ways around particular demands. Nevertheless, none had established a movement quite like the first Rainbow Coalition. This historic movement was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party stated that at the end of the day, we're, 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 we weren't engaged in a race struggle, he said it's a class struggle, goddammit. By uniting with the various oppressed ethnicities and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided. This class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against their common class oppressor the capitalist imperialist ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule and subsequently used the entire repressive forces of the state, police, courts, judicial, uh, 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 jails, prisons, intelligence agencies, etc., in order to crush this emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Second Rainbow Coalition on May 14, 14, uh, 14, 2001, with the intent of upholding the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation by upholding the 10-point program of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriots Organization, and all other original Rainbow Coalition members. We established our programmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold ties all organizations in our coalitions to a, to a coalition to a common professional discipline. History has bespo, uh, bespo, 
bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The representatives of the capitalist and privileged ruling class represented by the Democratic Party and Republican Party cannot liberate us. It is their class intention and interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organized stru organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what this second rainbow coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we intend to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. Uh, scroll down some more. Boots on the ground, all power to the people, boots on the ground. All members of the coalition, New African Black Panther Party, American Indian Movement, Indiana uh, uh, slash Kentucky, Chapter, White Panther Party, Green Party of New Jersey, uh, Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional, De Brown Berets, Fury, Nassau, uh, also Guardian Rebellion. I think this is an old, older uh, uh, statement of unity. That's the uh, Guardian Rebellion ain't on there, but they actually was voted in recently. Uh, the six disciplinary rules. One, members will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and pol politeness. Two, members will be sober when on Rainbow Coalition business and will not engage in any criminal activity while a member. Three, no member will engage in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Four, members will not gossip nor to be divisive to the unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Five, members will not act as informers nor work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. And six, nobody is authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition unless authorized to do so. So that, uh, everyone, is the Second Rainbow Coalition's uh, statement of unity, uh, that we want everyone within the Second Rainbow Coalition, no matter who you are, become familiarized with it, because this is our programmatic unity that ties us together. You know what I mean? Uh, the six rules of discipline also reflects uh, what we're going to be doing in the book reading program. The first one, being polite to each other, even if we uh, get to the book reading and we might di disagree with a topic that come up, we all recognize we comrades. So the way we go forward is to learn, have meaningful, constructive dialogue, meaningful and constructive criticism and self-criticism to make us better equipped for this generation. So with that said, we're about to jump into the first chapter, uh, which is the prologue. Uh, we will be reading one chapter uh, each session. So uh, Friday is one chapter, Sunday is one chapter, um, and also uh, Monday is one chapter. And this will be every week we will be doing this. So uh, everyone tune in for those other days as well. And you can use the same link but this is only for the members of the Second Rainbow Coalition. I'm gonna introduce myself real quick. I forgot about that. I'm gonna introduce myself and then we'll go around to the other moderators and they introduce themselves. I'm Kwame Shakur, the current uh, chairman of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Uh, I'm uh, happy to be a part of this uh, program uh, with y'all today. And I'm glad our team uh, that's uh, part of here is gonna be, uh, uh, <clears throat> helping make it uh, this successful. Everyone knows I used to be the former minister of culture for the New African Black Panther Party. Uh, uh, I resigned back in October, but we all, comrades, still, uh, I'm starting my own organization that will be soon uh, inducted into the Second Rainbow Coalition officially. You dig what I'm saying? So be looking out for the Black Liberation Party and Black Liberation Circle. One of my comrades on here today is doing our computer our technical thing, Gabriel, he's also with the Black Liberation Party and Black Liberation Circle. He will be introducing himself soon. Uh, so I go around to Alyssa, let her introduce herself, what organization she a part of. Hi, I'm Alyssa, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am the Minister of Defense of the New Era Young Lords Tri-State New England chapter. Oh, power to the people, comrades. She's a part of the moderators on our team. Uh, Johnny Torres, can you introduce yourself, comrade? Yes, I'm Johnny Torres from Los Brown Berets of Texas. And I'm a poet. I'm a, a Brown Beret here in Houston, Texas. And I'm just happy to be here, and I'm happy to see everyone here. Absolutely. Uh, power to the people. 
Uh, Gabriel, can you uh, introduce yourself real quick? Hello, I'm Gabriel, General Secretary of the Black Liberation Circle, a member of the Black Liberation Party. It's nice to meet everybody. Absolutely. Uh, prior to the people. Uh, uh, so we about to get started. Uh, people going to come in as uh, as we go. Uh, the moderator is going to start off doing the reading, and then we're going to ask some of the uh, audience. Uh, if they raise their hand, and we'll call upon you to take up where we're reading from. Uh, so we're, we're where it gets started, everybody can uh, turn to the page on the screen where the book, uh, I'm going to probably be reading from my personal book, but uh, Gabriel's going to be scrolling so everybody can follow along as we read. Uh, I'm going to start off with the dedication. You can keep it right there, though, Gabriel. Uh, I said this book is dedicated to Leon Benson and Royal Amos, who has spent over 23 years and over 15 years, respectively, in prison for the crimes the state of Indiana knows they did not commit. I also dedicate this book to Alonzo Hayes, my stepfather who passed in 2020. Uh, uh, with that said, I'm about to start off with the prologue. <clears throat> and then uh, I have uh, Lisa, uh, you take up after me after I get done. Then we'll go to Johnny Torres. And uh, then we'll ask someone to take up from, uh, from where he uh, left off. All right, it says <clears throat> in the prologue, as I sat in this stolen Cadillac, uh, before I start, uh, this this book shows my evolution. Uh, everybody know I went to prison, did 18 years uh, in prison for a bank robbery. This shows the evolution from a criminal mentality to a revolutionary mentality. You know what I mean? So I think this is going to be a good uh, case study of my life, uh, how I started to work out some of these answers in my life. Of, uh, and getting the truth, getting to meaning, becoming class conscious, and ultimately joining re the revolution, you know, in prison uh, first, but then when I got out, joined the revolution out here, boots on the ground out here. So this is going to be the uh, takeaway lesson of how we get to uh, become class conscious. How do we start to understand this class struggle that we in and unite with the people and understand what we fighting against and what we fighting for. You know what I mean? So this is the purpose of us reading this book is to learn the uh, uh, that consciousness don't come all of a sudden. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm showing the good, the bad, and the ugly in this and how I got to the point of where I am today. Uh, the prologue. As I sat in the stolen Cadillac that I had taken from one of the customers in the bank to make my getaway in, I waited for the approaching police siren to pass by the spot I was hitting at. I knew if he didn't observe me turn into the business complex himself or no one had pointed him in the direction to where I had gone, attempting to elude him, I knew I would escape not only him, but more important, either prison for a very long time or even death. I have been in several high-speed chases with the police over the past several months since getting out of boys' school. I learned a very important lesson from every one of them. I always try to abandon the vehicle you in as quickly as possible once you have established enough distance between you and them. Then, and only then, try to outmaneuver them on foot. Every time I followed that guide in principle, I had always evaded being apprehended. It got to the point after being in a number of high-speed chases and foot pursuits that I felt to a large degree that they could never catch me. In the end, I would get away, somehow, some way. Maybe I had deluded myself into believing that shit. But as a thing of survival and want to live out my own American dream one day, that belief fortified my commitment to viewing crime as a temporary way to attain my short-term and long-term goals for my circle and I. Like many in the streets, that wasn't an aberration at all. If it wasn't for Joseph E. Kennedy's hand in the illegal bootlicking black market, there may have never been a JFK. If it wasn't for Jay-Z trapping in the hood, it's a possibility that he would have never got the chance to be good friends with President Obama and been able to smoke Cuban cigars in Cuba when Cuba was still under U.S. embargo. One thing I realized early on, you're only a criminal if you're ever caught. 
If not, you're an underdog that had climbed to the top and even respected for doing so by the very same class of individuals who would have viewed you as being a mere criminal and reprobate otherwise. Many in the upper class biasly viewed themselves as being self-made too, no matter how they got to the social economic position they now hold. That was the unwritten rule in American culture that society had implicitly conveyed to those who chose crime as a realistic means to social mobility. The entire history of old Uncle Sam was a testament to that paradox. The truth though, is that not even first generation millionaires and billionaires are actually self-made, no matter if you're Joe King, El Chapo Guzman, or Bill Gates. Without being able to exploit others for their labor power and having a worldwide political economic infrastructure, monopoly board, quote unquote, that enables you to do so, it is impossible for anybody to become self-made. Yet that's not criminal in any way under the rules of the capitalist imperialist system, the political, the global political economic monopoly board, quote, unquote. As my adrenaline pumped and my heartbeat quickened, I heard the police siren turn in the same building complex I had turned into just minutes before instead of continuing down the road. At that very moment, I knew that the chances of me getting away this time had just increased drastically. However, after coming this far, I wasn't willing to concede defeat, no matter the odds that were increasingly stacking against me. Exiting in the car, I headed into the woods, which was west of where I had parked. The policeman who had exchanged, who I exchanged fire with in a bank parking lot, exited his car too in pursuit of me. I wasted no uh, time and let him know where I stood. I wasn't surrendering for anybody, anywhere, at any time, so I fired off a round in his direction as he was chasing me. Instead of keeping him at bay, though, he fired off a multi multitude of rounds at me as he continued to chase me as I entered the woods. This was the first time I had tried to invade the police in daylight hours. Every time I had been in a foot pursuit before, I had to cover a night as an ally that aided my escapes. The contrast between the two ambient backdrops immediately stood out to me. No matter how much I tried to outmaneuver him on foot, I recognized that he still would be able to keep a visual on me. That was a cumbersome feeling that increasingly became suffocating the longer I ran. Not long, too long, not too long into the chase, I heard another police siren in front of me. Initially, I only heard growing, it growing louder as the officer approached the same patch of woods from a different direction, but I couldn't see the police car itself. It was apparent, however, that he was trying to outflank me from the west. Now with one officer behind me converging on me from the east and another to trying to cut me off from the west, it was clear to me even then that my chances of escape were dwindling. Nevertheless, knowing that I had always gotten away from them before it made me all the more determined to have another war story to tell. As I approached the edge of the woods from a distance, the second police car slowly began to come into, into view. Immediately placing his car into park, the call officer exited his car. Once he did, I fired off a single round, hoping to keep him at bay. He ducked behind his car briefly, but when he saw me turn and run further into the woods, heading into a different direction, he emerged from behind the hood of his car and fired off a number of rounds before joining the foot pursuit himself. I remember the longer I ran through the woods as they continued to encircle me in different directions, yelling, uh, drop your weapon, while shooting at me as I ran, that my belief in being able to escape being given, uh, uh, escape began giving way to a sense of futility. It wasn't a sudden transition to despair. It was more like an avalanche of factors that continued to coalesce into a momentum, which I didn't feel I would be able to overcome. It didn't become complete and all encompassing until I heard the third officer converge on me from the South, which was the same direction I was heading in. Police! Drop your weapon, he yelled as he came into view, firing as, at me as the rest. At that very moment, life became surreal, almost fantasy-like. It seemed like I was in a movie at that point. It felt as if I was an objective observer who was uh, witnessing someone else facing an imminent death instead of me. It's definitely true that when you feel you're facing the last seconds of your life, everything seems to slow down and proceed in slow motion. My whole life didn't flash before my eyes, per se, but 
But I did begin to think about a number of people I would be leaving behind that I felt I failed for different reasons. My credo as a sticker man was that if I was ever cornered by the police, I would go out suicide by cop. I couldn't see myself spending the rest of my life in prison or even a few years. The year I did in boys school, boys school felt like an eternity. To do that for consecutive years or even possible decades was unfathomable. Therefore, I was all, always swore to myself that I would hold court in the streets if I ever came to that. If it ever came to that. Now faced with that predicament, I stopped running and began walking and started to reflect on some of those people I would be leaving behind that I would be letting down. Can you take over from there, Alyssa? All right. I'd met Peaches three weeks before the bank robbery. I came across her at the Vibe, which was one of the 21 and under clubs in NAP at the time. What immediately caught my eyes when I first spotted her was her bright yellow shirt that seemed to project her eye-stopping presence and captivating smile. Like most brothers, I've always been attracted to thick sisters, and she was definitely that. From what I could tell in the dimly lit club, she had to be about 5'2 or 5'3 and between 145 and 150 pounds in all the right places. What unquestionably was her best asset at first glance was her beauty. She was a solid 10 in my book. She was cold, but because I'd always been attracted to sisters of all shades and hues, her being a red bone didn't d increase her value in my eyes. She could have been blue, a blue black sister from Sudan and still been a solid 10 in my eyes. I wasn't one of those types of brothers who have been brainwashed so thoroughly by white supremacy that I categorized black women by their complexion. I dug all 31 flavors of them. Without thinking, I approached her and introduced myself, asking after asking her name and she telling me her name was Peaches, I remember extending my hand towards her and saying, by the way, my name is Dayan. <clears throat> I'm not sure why that resonated with her so much, but later on in our relationship, she commented on that as being something that made a lasting impression on her. I don't know. Maybe it had something to do with me not using any generic lines on her and just approaching her and just approaching her as most females wanted to be approached. I've never been a lines type of guy anyway, but I do think my level of confidence was a was a key factor to why she instantly was receptive to me. Later that night, she hit me up on my beeper. She wanted me to stop by her godmother's house where she was staying while in Indi Indianapolis for the weekend. At first, I thought I was going to it was going to turn into a booty call, and that'll be it. Just another chick I would come across and fuck with for a period of time for a period before coming across someone else who will replace her. That's how the fast life was. Instead of that happening, we sat and talked and I briefly got the chance to meet her godmother, Tweet. I instantly liked her as well. By the end of the night, I realized I had fallen for this girl. I had never fallen in love or been in love before, but I knew if there was ever such a thing as love at first sight, it had to be this. When I finally left her, we shared our last kiss of the night. I knew I would be approaching everything different with her. Our relationship quickly blossomed after that first day. Since both of my main guys were locked up on a case I had eluded the police on during another high-speed chase and robbery, it gave her and I nothing but time to connect. The fact that she lived up in Anderson and I only got the chance to kick it with her on weekends made those two days a week even more fulfilling. The chemistry between the two of us was unquenchable. It was like she was made for me and I for her. The last weekend we were together before the bank robbery was the most memorable moment that we were able to share together. I have been trying to bed her ever since the first night I'd met her at the club. She would always cut those passionate, heated moments short, telling me she didn't want to rush things. I'm sure I could have gotten, I'm sure I could have gotten her if I really pressured her, but I knew that's not all I wanted. I truly wanted a long-term relationship with her. So every time I found my hand sliding down her panties and she abruptly ended what we were doing, I would quickly reassure her her that I was willing to wait until she felt like she was ready for the next step. This time was different though. We never explicitly communicated that we were about to cross that threshold into our newfound relationship, but it was tactically understood by both of us. Just the day before, she and I had our first fallout. It was over some immature shit that I did, which she immaturely reacted to. For that reason, it wasn't hard for me to accept her apology and want to move on. Uh, I pressed the wrong thing. Hold on. Uh, uh, 
but she wanted to move on between us since ultimately I was solely responsible for making her rightfully angry with me. The unintended consequences of that, however, caused me to want to reconnect all the more deeply in order to solidify what we both wanted, a long lasting relationship. Consequently, that Sunday, I tried my best to do everything on her face and make her feel special. We started off that day going to church with my pater my paternal grandmother, who we all referred to as Nana. When then I spent the whole day taking her out to eat and just spending quality time together. We both felt so close to each other throughout the days, throughout the day that when I asked her towards the end of the night, did she want to go over to my guy Harry's house, my main stick-up partner, who was locked up in the Anderson County jail for a robbery I had gotten away on. We both knew what I was actually asking. When she looked at me with those lust-filled eyes of hers and said, yes, we both realized that this would be a day we would never forget. I remember while deep inside of her during our lovemaking at one point, she started crying. Then I stopped and asked her what was wrong. She told me and it fucked me up. She said, no, I'm all right. I'm just so happy to finally be starting over. I immediately understood what she was allu alluding to. She was referring to her boyfriend before me, who was actually the guy who took her virginity and was her first love. Continuing on with a plea in her voice, she said, Dan, just promise me that you will never leave me. Her saying that to me made me feel so absorbed in the moment that I felt our lovemaking had become too, had, had become an act of two souls striving and yearning to become one. Every time I thrusted between her thighs, it was as if I was attempting to merge our separate beings into a singular existence of now, the carnal form of nirvana. No other person had ignited that form of love and passion I had for her, especially at that moment. Responding back to her, I remember telling her, baby, I'm not going anywhere. And I meant it. I remember hearing that replay in my mind as I continued to walk through the woods. Baby, I'm not going nowhere. I knew, however, this robbery... I knew, however, this robbery ended, though. Peaches was going to be heartbroken. And the very thought of that tormented me more than the fact that I was facing my last moments on Earth. As I continued to walk through the woods, every so often I would look back and see where those three officers were at and how much distance they had closed. To keep them at a distance, I would occasionally turn around and point my gun at them without shooting to save bullets. Suddenly, they would duck behind the, cl the closest tree they were near and begin screaming, drop your weapon. Sometimes they would emerge and begin shooting again, but most of the time they would cautious, cautiously come back out into the open, intent on closing their net around me. I think they were trying to be conservative with their ammunition at times. Whenever I would turn around and see that they were at a safe distance again, I would turn back and continue to walk, reflecting upon others I would be letting down. I met, do to stop? Yeah, we'll have uh, uh, Johnny Torres take up from there. <clears throat> I met both Brian's and Harry while serving the time in Indiana Boys School in Plainfield, Indiana. Harry and I were all right when we were in Plainfield, but I wouldn't say he was my partner in crime or anything at the time. When I got out of pumped, bumped into him at the west skating rink we hooked up out of convenience like myself he was young black and ready to stop ask asking and start taking and that's exactly what we started doing the fact we had done time together in boys school we were both out now and had that same go get it mind frame where the only precurities, what did that say? Uh, prerequisites. Prerequisites needed for the two of us come together like Connect Four. On the other hand, Brian and I were more like blood brothers in the school. We were, we had started our own little clique, even though it started off with only five of us, we ran out of the cottage. We were, in spite of the fact that we were outnumbered by one of the street gangs on our unit, I learned a very important lesson early on that 
from where experience a small pride of lions will gradually, generally, 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 generally stand stronger than a pack of wild dogs. It wasn't so much about having the greater numbers always. It had more to do with the quality of individuals who would hold on their own first and foremost that truly determined the strength of a group. Rarely did we ever jump anybody. The one time that Brian's and I did, it was mainly to set off an example to everyone else. If you were foolish to enough to fuck with us, any of us stood this chance of summoning the wrath of all of us all. It was a de determined a deterrent deterrent strategy that worked flawlessly after we and I, when I smashed that first dude. With all the history behind us, and I was ready, a, a platform anti- uh, Anticipating. Anticipating his release when he ended up getting out of Plainfield several months after I had, we had planes of on taking what we started in cottage five to the streets uh, immediately. Ultimately, we, we wanted to become big players in the streets and make a name for ourselves. All of those street dreams we all had endlessly uh, prematurely when Harry and I decided to take Brian's on a, on a lick with us, I had committed so many petty robberies on carjackings and burglaries with Harry that we worked together like peanut butter and jelly whenever we were out pulling a caper. Neither of us had been out, been on with Brian's before, but I had it so intent on enlarging. Yeah, enlarging. Enlarging our robbery clique since he was out now that he decided on going on to Anderson one weekend to rob this dude named Cheese, a guy we were in boys school with. I don't think Harry knew Cheese. If I remember correctly, he gotten out before Cheese had out to co Cottage, five Br Bryans, and I couldn't stand Cheese with a passion though. One time we had set a crash dummy at him so nobody in the clique would have to get our hands dirty, so to speak. But it was, it just so happened that she ended up eventually whooping this dude that left a bitter taste in our mouths. The whole time we had, we were in Plainfield, another guy fucked up cheese with a lock in a sock a few months later, which we got eventually moved out of the cottage, but the dude had done that of his own accord. We didn't even need uh, and instigate that. Throughout, we didn't have a hand in the jumping off. It didn't take away from the heredity of it. Nonetheless, since we never got a chance to get in ourselves while in school, we felt it would be even more hilarious if we could rob him on the streets, completely embarrass him in the process. I suggested that we even make him strip down and get butt ass booty naked after he took everything, after he, we took everything he had. I imagined that the first person he come across in that condition would have assumed that more than his material possessions have been robbed of him. Yeah, that was some sadistic shit, but I thought it, no, but no longer you, that lifestyle. The more you grow numb to doing psychotic shit to others in a particular case, though, I only suggest doing that to him due to a humor, a rumor we had in boys school about something he did believe it was. We had no plans of robbing him. Barfaced, barfaced since barefaced, barefaced since all felt wouldn't told on us. 
told revenge on him, whooping out send off. Instead of. Uh, are you still going? Yeah. Okay. Instead of locating cheese, somebody pointed out to his cousin, AK to us, determined as we were locating him, as we tried to trying to track him down, so we couldn't, so we could include that this would just have to do. If I keep reading. Uh, yeah, read to the end of that paragraph, and then somebody uh, wanted to take over after him, put your hands up, and we'll call on that person to read next. Have to do plus the two chicks who are responsible for the two focus shifting to him. When his 9-8 drove past, told us getting money on the Wii tip, what better way to get our, get our, back, get our back than to come and in the process of doing it. Brian, you next, Brian. Long story short, we ended up botching that whole robbery. If there was ever one which we could have been on most dumbest criminals for, it was definitely that one. Due to the fact that Brains had never been on a lick with us before, he'd been more in the way than of any help. I accidentally shot at him and everything, thinking he was one of AK's guys. I had the pistol to AK and made him empty his pockets when Brains unexpectedly emerged from behind AK's house. The whole robbery would have gone south if he would have immediately indicated in any way that he was friend rather than foe. You would think that a person would have done that when you started pointing the gun back and forth between him and AK. Nah, instead of brains doing that, this motherfucker started saying in a deep voice, trying to disguise it, don't move, motherfucker. And then, and some other ridiculous shit that I can't even recall right now. Nevertheless, seeing that this dude behind AK's house didn't even have a gun pointed at me when he said all this, I was thinking to myself, what? Don't move, motherfucker. I'm the one with the gun trained on you and him. I will dome shot both of you motherfuckers if either one of y'all move. The Brains hadn't acted like a neophyte bandit out there that night. I think we could have wiped him down for about $4,000 in weed and money, according to one Anderson native I had come across years later while in prison, who knew the dude, who knew dude and told me what sort of weight he was working with at that time. But instead of that happening, we only got away, uh, where was I? According to one Anderson native I had come across years later while in prison, who knew dude and told me what sort of weight he was working with at the time. But instead of that happening, we only got away with a broken gold chain and about $60 in pocket money. More important, I don't think any of us would have gone down for that lick and brains would have have nearly lost his life over crumbs. It's crazy how the lower class, those at the bottom in this capitalist society, find themselves pitted against each other to what amounts to, in the last analysis, crumbs. Of that memorable night was when we were headed back to Nat from Anderson. It's the first one to notice a car following us. The only possible suspect who came to my mind was AK. I couldn't see why any other person would follow us besides him. And I definitely felt like he was on the best crack known to mankind to think he was going to be able to effectively retaliate in that manner. I told Harry, who was driving, to slow down so I couldn't see who this person or persons were. If need be, I was going to roll down my window and start busting if it was ever in the car right there on the highway to let them know this ain't what y'all want. I never got that chance, fortunately, because not too long after we slowed down, the police lights came on above the car. In that very instance, we realized this motherfucker had called the police on us for attempting to rob him for his weed and money. Are you serious? It never occurred to me in all the years of my life that there were some people in the drug game who viewed the police as a possible ally in maintaining their way of life. As paradoxical as it may seem, when I went to prison, I'd come across a number of guys who had similar stories or ones even more ironic than mine to tell. I had guys tell me about dudes who were confidential informants for the police, 
yet would be out robbing other drug dealers while selling dope themselves. Many times, the police would even know about the other extracurricular activities, yet would turn a blind eye to them since they were getting actionable intelligence from these flip-floppers. Some in the streets knew about the double roles these guys would play and either would be smart and try to avoid them and keep them out of business, or would be unprincipled and try to work it to their advantage in some way. I often wondered why anybody in the streets would fuck with someone who was willing to straddle the fence and not be truly loyal to anyone. It was like they were willingly deluding themselves into believing that they wouldn't one day too become a victim of, to their two-facedness like everybody else. I guess when all one cares about is getting money, okay, all money ain't good goes right out the window. As soon as the police lights came on, the cars behind us, Harry hit the gas in a stolen car we were in. This was one of the few stolen cars that I actually fell in love with. For me, those sort of accuracies back in 98 were the poor man's equivalent to a rich man's Lexus. That's before the Chrysler 300s came out in the 2000s and became the affordable Bentley. Originally, I was gonna take it to an associate of mine who planned on getting it chopped up in Chicago for a nice price. Later, he renewed on the, reneged on the agreement, so I just kept it to hit licks in. Speeding down the highway, going over 100 miles per hour easily, we quickly extended our distance between the police cruiser and us. About a minute into the chase, we recognized that the highway was converging into a single lane due to road construction. There was a semi-truck in front of us at a distance to our right and a concrete median directly to our left, separating the two sides of the highway. The closer we started to near the semi as the highway was converging into one lane, we realized that this motherfucker was actually trying to help the police by cutting us off. Sensing that, we encouraged Harry to try and beat him to the merge. To this day, I'm positive that if anybody else would have been driving that night, we might have lost our lives by getting dri driven into that concrete medium by that Captain Savaho. That's how close we were when we swerved around across the semi, barely missing the concrete divider by inches. After escaping that close brush with death, I think we all exhaled in relief. No sooner had we surmounted that obstacle, we observed another one growing in the distance. The police had blocked off the highway about three miles down the road. There was no question in our minds that they'd spiked the road and were waiting to ambush us with their weapons wrong. Anticipating this, we immediately pulled to the other side of the highway, abandoned the car and left the fence. That's except me. I got caught on the fence and had to call for Harry to come over and help me over. As he unhooked me, I left over and we decided to go our separate ways. Harry and I had been in a similar situation before. So we are split up in order to spread them out and divide the in the end. Um, in the end, it would give us individually a greater probability to take advantage of their dispersed configuration. I remember coming to the one road which was blocked off to my left and having to crawl across the street as if there was razor wiring above me in a neutral war zone area or something. The only other time that I stood a chance of being apprehended was when I was walking down these train tracks and saw two cops and a police dog about 100 yards behind me uh, suddenly emerge into view. As soon as I saw them, I quickly ducked into the wooded area along the train tracks and brought my gun to my side. I had every intention to shoot them or that dog if they even act like they were on to me. I wasn't going to let a dog get a hold of me. That's for damn sure. The only reason I escaped being caught while they both ended up being apprehended was because I crossed the other side of the highway several miles down the road before they brought the bluebird out to age in their search. I had a gut feeling that they were going to enlist a police helicopter in their pursuit eventually since it was pitch black dark at night and we were in an affluent white residential area. Never once did they check the other side of the highway or I might have gotten booked in the Madison County Jail as well that night. That night after I took a taxi back to my car and made it safely back home, all I could do was think about Brains and Harry as I laid on my couch in the dark. The last time Harry and I'd been in a situation like this, he, like that, he had hit me up on my beeper, letting me know he needed me to come and get him. This time, I never got that call from him or Brains. The next time I heard from either one of them, the operator informed me of their whereabouts by saying, you have a collect call from an inmate at Madison County Jail. At that moment, I knew what it was for them both. 
first time I hollered at Harry on one of those collect calls, I promised him that I would come up with their bail money without incriminating myself over the phone. I knew the only way that was going to happen, though, was to resort to the same thing that had gotten them busted, armed robbery. I wasn't too concerned or apprehensive about any of that since by then I'd already become hardened by the lifestyle and upping pistols on people. I actually viewed the predicament I was in more as, as an opportunity to shine than a real burden on my shoulders to bear. Up until then, I figured our robbery game would end up evolving to include banks eventually anyways. I think the only reason we hadn't hit one yet was because Harry and I hadn't discussed it. On the other hand, there was something I had personally thought about on numerous occasions. Their apprehension only made what was to me an eventuality become the only real possibility I had, not only to procure their bail money, but also to concretely take our clique to a whole new level. Part of my street dreams was because, I can stop. No, I'll read one more uh, paragraph and then someone else raised their hand, uh, want to take over after him. Okay. Part of my street dreams was becoming El Jefe, the boss, one day. I had always viewed myself as being a leader and a visionary. For me, armed robbery was the only means to get there. I assumed that if I got my guys out and got away with at least $100,000 in the process, that would be more than enough to secure their release, get them lawyers, and protect myself legally too, while getting a few kilos of that white girl to jumpstart my rise. I would planned on knighting Harry and Brains and a few of my other guys as my lieutenants. I didn't know at the time that most bank robbers only got away with, on average, between three and $4,000. I'd gotten nearly $11,000 on mines, but even that would only accomplish the bare minimum of my intended. Nonetheless, as long as I would have been able to free them, I would have been cool with leaving El Jefe for another day. The creed I lived by was that if any of my homies fell, it was only gangster to keep it real with them. That's what real niggas did. Uh, someone wants to take over. Thanks, comrade, for that. Uh, raise your hand if you want to take over. If not, I will jump back in. <coughs> All right, I'm about to uh, jump back in. As I continue to walk through the woods, I begin to think about Brains and Harry. Like Peaches, I was haunted by the thought of not being able to escape this unscathed and being able to fulfill my promise to them. My thoughts likewise shifted to my mother. I knew I had filled her more than anybody. Like everybody, else I had thought about as I anticipated the, the inevitable when the images of my mom, my mom began flashing across the screen of my memories. They flooded my psyche in such a way that I felt as if my diminishing spirit and fortitude had been recharged with their added vigor. With that renewed burst of determination, I turned back around and fired off a round to stop them immediately in their tracks before dashing towards the open field that I observed at a distance. The whole time I was running towards that field, I was weaving around the trees, trying to make it harder for them to shoot me. Their engagement from there on was relentless. I was being shot at nonstop from multiple directions, spread out over 20 to 30 yards between each of them. Luckily, none of their bullets hit me. That is until I reached the edge of the woods and jumped behind what must have been the thinnest tree lining those woods. To this day, I still can't believe I chose that one to hide behind, which was more like a twig with roots stuck in the ground than anything. Maybe they weren't any uh, bigger ones around where I was at. I'm not sure. I can't re quite recall. But that tr tree became my last stand. I just remember turning around behind that tree and being instantly struck in the upper uh, thigh area near my groin. I'd never been shot before, let alone by a 40 caliber pistol. That bullet hit me with such force that it felt as if Mike Tyson had hit me with a baseball bat with all his might. My whole right leg swung away from me, nearly 90 degrees from where I had it, it had just been. At that moment, I knew it was over. Figuring I knew which officer was responsible for uh, for me being shot, uh, hit, I took aim at him and fired off my last round. A piece of bark next to the tree he was standing by flew off right next to his head. When I realized I had missed him, I turned and sprinted into the open field knowing it was all over. 
only 20 or 30 yards into my dash of desperation, I was struck by a bullet in my left leg from a female officer who I never even knew was out there that day. In retrospect, she had to be posted up at a distance on the opposite side of that field somewhere. All I know is that her accuracy was a lot better than all three of those male officers. It was her gun that finally brought me down. Lying on the ground, I remember contemplating my next moves as time once again slowed down dramatically. It was a shock to me that I was even still alive. There's no question in my mind that some of those bullets were inches away from causing fatal injuries like the one the first officer had fired at me in the bank's parking lot. I can clearly recall jumping into the Cadillac and putting it into reverse when two bullets penetrated the windshield centimeters above my head. I could literally hear those bullets wheezing right over my head as I ducked. Luckily, I did duck when I was putting the car into reverse where I'm positive that both of those bullets would have been kill shots. I probably would have never been, uh, uh, it would have never even known i have been hit. I'm sure it I would have died instantly. It's crazy when I think back to that day now because I wanted to die. I didn't want to have to spend decades in prison. I didn't want to, uh, I wanted that own death penalty. There were many days in the county jail and in prison, I found myself being depressed simply because I had made it, made it through. I felt that life had played a very cruel trick on me since I couldn't even re find relief in death when that's what every fiber in my uh, being craved. You see, a lot of my suicidal urges in that regard can be traced back to my religious upbringing. My whole life, I had been hunted by the ultimate purpose of life. Which was as I was told, which was as I was told to be saved in the name of Jesus and be worthy to be admitted into the pearly gates of heaven. That was the whole significance of life itself. Nothing more, nothing less. We were put here on this earth only to pass this cosmological test between God and Satan. For that reason, I felt like my life was nothing but a card game between God and the devil, each ultimately trying to see who would tally the most souls in the end. My whole life, I felt like a pawn on this cosmological chessboard of theirs. What killed me the most was that I was always told that I had a choice. Yeah, okay. If I had a real choice, my choice would have never been a willing participator in this cosmological game. Point blank, period. I couldn't understand why others didn't see just how foolish all this shit was. It was meaningless. There's no other way I could put it. Growing up, I had always felt that Black people in particular were cursed in two regards. First, we were born into sin like everyone, everybody else, all because two people ate a fruit from a tree that they weren't supposed to. That seemed crazy in itself to me that I was being punished for something somebody else did thousands of years ago. Second, if that wasn't bad enough, according to the Hammond curse found in Genesis 9, 18 through 27, Black people were sanctioned to be slaves to white people and Arab people, all because him had come to his father's Noah's aid and assistance by alerting his brothers about his condition. If anything, he should have been rewarded for his act of concern rather than, uh, uh, than he and his descendants being cursed for generations. Again, for me, life had been a true curse, literally and frequently from the very beginning, ever since I had been indoctrinated with those teachings from the Bible. I could never understand why a loving God would allow slavery to be a legitimate sanction to be placed on an entire race of people, let alone punish our whole species for disobedience of two people that he created. It all seemed rigged to me from the jump, and I wanted out this game of three-card molly. I have always told, uh, was told that if I repent at the end of my life, even on my deathbed, I would be allowed to enter through the pearly gates of heaven. I view that simple caveat in the game as my loophole out of this cosmological test that made life so unbearable ever since coming to know right from wrong, quote, unquote. Contemplating my options as I lie on, lie on the ground, instead of upping my empty pistol to make them kill me, I immediately turned around and put my hands up in the air. The fact that my breathing had become unusually labored I figured I would be dying soon from the significant loss of blood. I didn't want to have to take any more lead in order to accomplish what I saw as the inevitable anyways. I nearly didn't have a chance in that matter though, because while I had my hands up in the air, the first officer continued to shoot at me 
despite despite me giving up. I remember feeling one of those bullets striking me in my lower extremities too. Seeing I was unarmed, they say, that same officer rushed over to me and slammed me face first into the ground while he repeated over and over again, stop resisting. The funny thing about that was that I wasn't resisting whatsoever. I mean, where in the fuck would I was gonna get up and, uh, and run to with two shot up legs that I could no longer feel, losing blood by the pint anyways. Later, I would continue to recognize that stop resisting shit as a legal loophole for them to, in order to justify any continued excessive force they used against you. As long as they could claim that you were resisting and that they were in fear of their lives subjectively, the courts will view their escalated level of force as being objectively reasonable according to law. They all did it. It was an unwritten rule of theirs, which I would be a witness to time and time again over the years. I didn't care about that at the time, though. I was just glad it was finally over. With my hands now cuffed behind my back, and my as my breathing grew even more erratic and labor, I quietly said a prayer of repentance, repentance to myself, and closed my eyes and waited for the end. So that's the uh, uh, prologue. Uh, we had an uh, hour uh, into this, so we got about 30 minutes uh, to discuss um, or answer any questions anyone has of uh, what we just read. Uh, I would just say that uh, when I look back to that time of my life now, it's kind of surreal uh, that I even went through that experience in my life. You know what I mean? Uh, sometimes I wonder what my life would have been if I never went to prison, because uh, you can see Throughout my life, I was kind of struggling with a lot of internal contradictions that uh, was, uh, wasn't was resolved and put me in a mind frame where I could do like crazy stuff like this because I didn't have no respect for my own life. And when you don't have respect for your own life, you really can, uh, you, you probably one of the most dangerous people because you can do pretty much anything, you know what I mean? And that's what this uh, chapter is conveying. You know what I mean? Uh, when when you have that lack of meaning in, in, inside and you accept crime as a uh, passport of social mobility to that American dream, uh, uh, you become a problem to your community. You dig what I'm saying? Uh, rather than a solution. And as we read all on throughout the book, you'll see that that type of mind frame started to change when I start to realize like, uh, the real biggest meaning of life is living for the people, living for the community, living for a better society, uh, a society that don't put people in conditions where they feel so pressured uh, to get that American dreams by taking from other people, by selling dope, by doing all these different things that's detriment to uh, our community. You know what I mean? So uh, that's one thing I wanted y'all to take away from that. Uh, but if anyone uh, has anything to say or have any questions or any statements, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, but one of the moderators, if y'all want to jump in and share uh, y'all thoughts with uh, with us first about what we read. Um, yeah, I can go. Oh, my bad. I didn't know you were going. Oh. I had Johnny Torres and then Alyssa and then whoever else uh, start raising your hands and we'll start calling them up on y'all. Uh, I really do love it. It sounds uh, very, uh, the way that everything, it was very visualized and very vintage, the way the, the writing style is, the way you uh, take me over there and the way I see everything playing out. Um, it's, um, it's very tragic how this all takes place, but it, it definitely uh, makes me wake up at, at the, uh, you know, uh, to decisions, how when you're, uh, you know, you feel like this is your last breath and you're thinking, overthinking everything, like life uh, flashes before your eyes kind of moment. I kind of felt that what you were going through in a way and you were thinking of all the moments you had, the good times and, you know, maybe uh, like, damn, I'm letting some of these people down and, you know, you let your hands up even though you could have gone out with bullets, but you like, nah, I feel like there was more than life than that. So like, I just love the way the whole thing's written down and these, uh, the characters that are already in it. Let me ask you this, uh, are the characters um, Brains and uh, Harry, are, are those are the real characters name or are you just uh, added just different names to it? 
Well, uh, that's a good question. Brains and Harry, actually, they real names. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I was in boys' school. Later on, I'm going to talk about them because uh, I ended up coming across them in different ways later on. Uh, and y'all get to that part of the story. I don't want to get that away. Uh, Peaches is actually the nickname of my first love. Uh, instead of using her first name and stuff, because we not together, you know, married now and everything. So I uh, love my wife to death. Uh, I changed her name to her, the nickname that I gave her back in the days and stuff. So that's uh, that's the only one in there that I think in this chapter is uh, a nickname or a change name and not their government name. Uh, thanks for that question, though, Johnny. Because I, like I said, I, I like the way everything was set up, and I'm like, uh, Harry and Brains. That just sounds like you know, very uh, vintage names to give out to the in the, in the bank robbery. And like, I, I just assumed those were their bank robbery names or something. But uh, that's cool. It's good to know that those were their own names. All right. Absolutely, Alyssa. Um. Well, I agree. I definitely, you had me laughing. Um, it's not funny. It's awful. But I was laughing when you were mad at yourself about which tree you picked. Um, <laughs> like, I could literally hear you having that conversation, which had me laughing really hard. Um, but the last part of it is not something that had me laughing. Um, the last part where you talk about, what's the... Uh, as long as they could claim that you're resisting and that they were in fear for your life subjectively, the courts would view their escalated level of force as being objectively reasonable according to the law. We watch that every day, literally every day. Like the, um, the one that was, that keeps playing through my head is the, the English teacher, Keenan Anderson. They keep telling this man to, to, turn over while there's a whole entire human on top of him and it, then there's and and you notice now that i've you know watched as much many of the police brutality videos and stuff like that as i've seen it's like you hear one of them is barking something and then the other one is barking something else and it's just how are you supposed to like there's no synchronicity between them and it's just like constantly like i can you're getting shot at by three cops at a time um, there's one person yelling at you to stop resisting. There's another person yelling at you to flip over. There's another person trying to tase you. And I mean, this was obviously over 20 years ago. And we know historically that that has not, you know, been any better, but it's just, that really kind of was like, I literally was like in my head, I could see the video that I had been watching about Keenan um, Anderson while I was reading that bottom part. That, that one's really and my brain lit up the past few days, but well, maybe two days. I think it just happened, but that's all. Yeah, uh, and uh, I actually put upload that video of my rest on my YouTube channel uh, by the same name, Kwame Chase Shakur. Is uh, you have to scroll down to see that uh, video. Somebody was asking me to upload it because uh, I was standing with families that's being killed by the police and stuff. And even though in my case is very different by, from most cases throughout the United States, most cases that uh, people get shot up and killed by the police and stuff like that is actually nonviolent situations, not criminal situations. It's traffic stops, it's wellness checks, it's people uh, that they, uh, how the media portrays us as being all like animals and savages uh, and criminals where a lot of people get uh, killed just because subjectively the police claim to be in fear of their life. You know what I mean? But when my hands was up in the air, there was no reason for them to keep on shooting. There was no reason for me to got shot again. You know what I mean? It's no reason for them to come up and slam my face all in the ground and rough me up and stuff like that. It's like, after a while, it's like, uh, you, you realize like, uh, being within the system that no matter if you did a criminal act and majority of cases, people don't, uh, they use this resistance stuff as a reason to justify them carrying out excessive force against us, beating us down, uh, tasing us, sicking dogs on us. <laughs> and I see those same videos, you know what I mean? Uh, over the years where you be like, man, so why did that person get tased and be eaten up by dogs? And why is they hands cut behind their back and they still punching them and 
uh, shooting them and all kind of stuff. You know what I mean? But this just go to show you this is how this system is rigged against seeing all black and brown individuals as threats and uh, 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 people that they can uh, just violate their rights indiscriminately. You know what I mean? I wanted to convey that in that. So that's why I put that in there. Uh, Veronica. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to uh, to bring in a quote that came up for me as you started reading. Um, and the quote is from uh, comrade uh, George Jackson, blood in my eye. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so I just, I couldn't help thinking about it. Um, so he says, I've been in rebellion all my life. I just didn't know it. For a young black growing up in the ghetto, the first rebellion is always a crime. And so, you know, as I hear you, you know, kind of going through this thought process of where would I be, you know, if I hadn't went to prison, uh, you know, and, and everything that led up to that, you know, I just couldn't help but think about that, that quote, you know, um, and then also on the first page where you, you go into, where you say one thing I realized early on you're only a criminal if you ever get caught. If not, you're an underdog that had climbed to the top and even respected for doing so by the very same class of individuals who would have viewed you as being a mere criminal and reprobate otherwise. You know, so just kind of the irony of that, you know, mm -hmm. that the conditions are, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's designed this way, mm -hmm. um, you know, but even, you know, this, this notion of um, power, you know, and everybody's try, trying to get a piece of that pie somehow, you know, but even as, you know, you're, you're running away from them, you're, you're cognizant of, you know, what the consequences may be, you know, and <laughs> you were willing to die. I mean, you almost laid it down, you know, you almost handed it to them, even though you were still running, you know, and I just think about, you know, as the other comrades are saying, in today's day, I mean, it, it don't take a quarter of what, what transpired in this event, you know, for, for a, a brother or a sister to end up, you know, dead. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's an honor to be able to be on here, uh, you know, hearing your story and, um, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, as you were saying, uh, make uh, uh, reading that quote by George Jackson, it made me think about this. When they demonize like uh, the black and brown community as being this stereotypical criminal, think about this. We were stealing at the most, like from our own community, uh, most of the time, uh, robbing at the most uh bank you know what i'm saying but think about this and they call that criminal but guess where that mind frame is reflected on a global level they rob while we rob people in our community and stores in our community they rob whole countries for their resources <laughs> you know what i mean but they call us criminals where did we get that way of thinking from where we saw that taking from other people is a way to come up and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, establish our own empire. You know what I mean? We just did it in the back. Just we did it in the creeps. You know what I'm but that same just time now. of thinking how these imperialists are, you know, what I'm be a byproduct of a social conditioning on the epidemic capitalist level of this thing. Uh, can somebody uh, mute their mic? Uh, the legitimate level of global capitalism, they doing what the criminals is doing in the streets on a exponentially higher level. You know what I'm saying? They're they taking out whole countries uh, and putting in dictators and stuff that's oppressing their people. They're committing genocide against people. They going to war, you know what I'm saying, against different countries to expand their empire and maintain their hegemony in the world. But we, they call us criminals and they just single us out. But we a product of you, Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> you know, <Right. laughs> who was the biggest threat? And I talk about this and I'm going to talk about this repeatedly throughout the book. Was it Frankenstein or Dr. Frankenstein? 
and I say it was Dr. Frankenstein, we are product of his social conditioning, of his mm -hmm. making. And it's when we become conscious of that, that we break from that creation and that social conditioning that made criminality uh, 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 a realistic uh, uh, aspiration of us a reality that keeps us dysfunctional in our community. We got to break that mentality. We got to understand where that mentality even came from. And it came from the original criminals that first took the land over here in the United States, as we talked about in the statement of unity, you know what I mean? And the preface, it was the individuals that went in old whole countries and took over the land of those countries. You know what I'm saying? Or we even think about today with the, the immigrants at the borders that's coming over here. Nah, it, it's not them crossing the border. <laughs> it's the border that crossed them, that made them criminals today. That was Mexican land. 55% of Mexico was taken from Mexico. And now we putting on same people in their native land. When they come back over here to their native land, we they call them foreigners, they call them illegal aliens. They put them in ICE detentions. You know what I'm saying? They put their kids in these concentration camps, but we don't call them criminals, they criminals. And we need to call it for what they really are. And we need a break from that same mentality that they instilled and conditioned in us. That's how we start to form that consciousness, uh, understanding whether who the true criminals are and why they system is illegitimate. You know what I mean? So right, I appreciate right. that. That made me think <laughs> about that. Uh, when you made uh had that uh made that comment about George Jackson, that quote. Uh so I appreciate that, Conrad Veronica. Uh Absolutely. El Lobo. Hey, thank you, Conrad. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, you know what's interesting is um I try to follow a lot of like uh police reform. Um I Man, it was a it it, it, it kind of had a really big uptick during the uh, 2020 uh, George Floyd protest era. There was a lot of reform actually here in Oregon and nationwide. And then I put a uh, a link to an article I read in your stomping grounds of something that happened in Indiana where you could like stand your ground or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I can't I can't <laughs> help to think, you know, having somewhat of a medical background, how many times things happen where the threat is eliminated and yet the pit or excuse me, the officer is still um, not rendering aid. Like for example, we know what happened to brother Philo Castro, uh, Philandro Castillo. Yeah. Philandro Castillo, he was a registered gun owner legally worked with kids in his community, worked in the school district and the cop just shot him in the passenger seat. And he had a little girl behind him. Like, and then the threat was totally over. The dude literally died on Facebook Live. The cop could have holstered his weapon, applied a tourniquet, whatever. I don't know how many videos I see where the threat is eliminated and they just do not render aid. And so I don't know if they're ever, if they would ever pass legislation and make that like a mandatory. But I'm just curious in your instance, when I was reading the book, which to me, it kind of felt like watching a movie. I was like, damn, this is a heater. Like, their president is like, damn, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> when I was like, oh, man, he got hit in the thighs. That's a, <laughs> there's some major arteries there. So when you were talking yeah. about blood loss, I was like, I am so surprised you made it through that. Did they even, did these pigs even at least try to give you uh, first aid, bro, when you, uh, when, when they took you down eventually? Uh, nah, they waited for the ambulance and the ambulance took a while to get there, you know what I mean, to come and get me. Uh, you was talking about, uh, there's a lot of arteries in there. They actually, uh, shot my, um, femoral, not artery, but vein, uh, which is pretty close to my femoral artery. I don't know if y'all remember that Washington, uh, Washington, uh, uh, NFL player. I think he was a wide receiver. He got shot, uh, uh. One time in his thigh, and it severed his femoral artery, and he actually died from that. You know what I mean? So I got kind of got lucky where it only shot my femoral vein. That's why it was a whole lot of blood loss. But when I was in the hospital, um, in the emergency room, when they was doing uh, emergency surgery, at one point they couldn't stop the bleeding, so they was actually thinking about amputating my leg. You know what I mean? 
uh, oh, luckily stopped the bleeding. And so that's why I'm able to have two legs and walking around like everyone else today. But it did cause a lot of like uh, nerve damage where to this day, I don't have like feeling around the shin area. Uh, now, uh, 20 years, over 20 years later, like my legs trying to give me little problems where it's a little bit uh, stiff, more stiff. And sometimes it tightens up or uh, really uh, walk naturally, not Every blue moon have a limp. I gotta put some uh, stuff on there uh, to like loosen up my leg, my leg and stuff. But it, yeah, those I, I'm thankful now that like my uh, those those doctors in that situation uh, stopped the bleeding and that. I tell y'all an interesting thing that uh, I didn't put in my book. At one point, I woke up with the tubes down in my throat. Uh, the anesthesia, I guess, it wasn't strong enough. They hadn't given me enough, so I woke up and sat up on the operating table while they was operating on me. And the two was going, breathing uh, oxygen into me so slow. I'm looking at the doctor and like, I'm looking at it with my eyes and like, man, I can't breathe, you know what I mean? And so they hurried up and shot more anesthesia in me. And that's all I remember. I remember falling back and passing out. And that's the last thing I remember and stuff, you know what I mean? But uh, that's an interesting fact that I didn't talk about in my book. Uh, Johnny Torres. Uh, yeah, uh, I definitely want to uh, read a poem that I wrote last year about police brutality and definitely a, a couple of subjects which you uh, focus on. If we have enough time, I, I think. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. OK. It's called. He demilitarized the police. Hands up. Caps, cops keep telling us hands up. Then your life flashes before your eyes. Being a person of color is a death sentence. What's wrong with the police in America? They must have the hate disease. Caller and the responder. The cops feared for their lives. The aggressor turned into a victim. Some immigrants. They felt threatened by the words they didn't understand. What black and brown people alive means, they, they only care about white liberty. This is not a country, but a zoo where mentally violent pigs are on a prowl. People's hands were up and the pigs shot them anyway. If you don't comply, you die. They call themselves police officers, cowardly spineless scum, the reputation of the American police have is laughable and disturbing. Throughout the world, it has always been land of the free for the police. The earth will soon be deceased. The police say things like stop resisting so they can abuse you into submission. The easy way or the hard way? What's the hard way? Death? Racist cops need to go because they can't keep violating our rights. I've seen this city tear each other apart because of the cops' murderous actions. As citizens, you should confront the police. Don't walk by, it can, it can be you murdered next. The thin blue line is full of shit. Corrupt cops are still working on the force. Their job is to watch over people, not to punish and enslave. Too much abuse and authority, gang mentality from the boys in blue. When are you gonna get it? These pigs will keep abusing us until we fight back. The reason why the majority of our masses don't even trust the police anymore to protect and serve is delusional. Thank you. That's what's up, comrade. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, man, uh, it, it just really emphasized uh, like like uh, a lot of stuff, they try to make themselves out to be in a uh, community, serve and protect. Like it don't mess up with the statistics. You know what I'm saying? Uh, last year, 20, uh, 2022 was the highest number of police killings on record in the United States, two years after George Floyd. You know what I'm saying? Most cases ain't like mine. Like you said, you, uh, you brought up... Uh, uh, Philandro Castile was you either you or Lobo brought up uh, Castro Castile. Think about this. This is a brother that was pulled over in Minneapolis and told the police, 
I have a registered gun in my uh, glove compartment. You know what I mean? He's in there with his girlfriend and his daughter in the back seat. You know what I mean? And uh, when when he reaches to show uh, for the registration, after telling him I have a registered gun in my back seat, I mean in, in my glove compartment, they still gunned down uh, Landro Castillo. They still saw him as a threat, even when he told them he was reaching for. Uh, in the glove department to get his registration, but inside there it is a registered gun. But you still saw uh, him as a threat and gun this man down. And uh, from my understanding, that case still that them. They've been taken in custody recently, uh, peacefully. <laughs> after shooting and killing many different people. We've seen this over and over and over again. You know what I mean? Even the one that broke into Nancy Pelosi's uh, house and beat the fuck out of her husband. You know what I'm saying? They took him in peacefully. Just imagine if that was one of us, black and brown individuals went off in Nancy Pelosi's house or something. We would have been gunned down immediately. You know what I'm saying? But we ain't even the ones out here doing this type of shit. You know what I'm saying? They don't even see these white supremacist terrorists really in the same capacity that they see black and brown men out here in the community. They see us as bigger threats. And that's because they recognize our revolutionary potential. And it's a part of their genocide. You know what I'm saying? That they carrying out upon us ever since, you know, the 60s. You know what I'm saying? Recognize they don't want no 60s movement no more. We're going to get eventually to this part of my book where I bring up the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And she breaks down the policy of the new Jim Crow uh, and the war on drugs was a counterinsurgency strategy against black and brown people because they saw us as uniting the people in the 60s and bringing about revolutionary consciousness. You know what I'm saying? They wanted to eliminate that with a hard policy of genocide and mass incarceration to stop us. Yeah, January, yeah, look at what January 6th uh, situation. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up, Logo, because this Lobo, this was second year anniversary of that. And how many of those individuals is really serving a lot of time for going and trying to, let's call it what it is, carry out a coup. <laughs> they was going to overthrow their own government and they see them to this day as lesser of a threat. You know what I mean? They give it, some of them only got months in prison for going in there. And we all saw that with our eyes, what that was about. Even that president, that fascist, uh, Donald Trump, you know what I'm saying, that led it, he's still out here today. He running for president again. You know what I mean? He just was with Bolsonaro from the, the former dictator fascists of Brazil when they carried out their January 6th uh, coup attempt down there while Buzz, uh, Bolsonaro was down in Florida. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he down there with Donald Trump for the two-year anniversary, and they do the same thing down in Brazil. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, we living in a time that... Uh, one thing we have to recognize is the existential threat against all of us. This is why this second rainbow coalition is so meaningful to us building our solidarity amongst ourselves, protecting our community, seeing ourselves as the solution to the problem. You know what I'm saying? And we should always keep on building and developing this because this is the only way we can liberate ourselves. It's not going to be the Democrats. They fascists too. You know, it was it was Mary Daly that carried out that fascist repression on the first Rainbow Coalition and killed and assassinated Fred Hampton. That was Democrats. That was a fascist policy they was carrying out against our community to smash our movement. But look, we back. <laughs> we back. We the we the children. We the, we the children of that generation that's taking up that torch today and going to carry this legacy going forward because now we conscious of what our historical mission is, like Franz Fanon said, and we're going to complete this mission this time. I know, Alyssa, you put your hand down, but uh, did you still have something? And then I go to Veronica. Um, I was just going to tie. The, the Philando Castile story is, so they did nothing wrong. It was a, it was a traffic stop, right? 
um, Keenan Anderson flagged the cops down from my understanding because he had gotten into a fender bender, I believe. And that is what ended up being, getting him caused to be tased to death. Mm. Um, and he was also an English teacher. Uh, well, Lando Castile was, I believe, in, in nutrition, if I remember correctly, at the school. But um, yes, Keenan Anderson was an English teacher, I believe a high school English teacher. And ironically, probably not, um, is related to one of the BLM co-founders. I uh, want to say, yeah, I I wanna yeah. say it's Patrice, but I'm not sure. Okay. And so if that is the case, Mm, they definitely knew who he was you know what i'm saying like right. there's just i don't know that whole situation just seems it i mean it was disgusting in general but like that could be anybody it didn't have to be it didn't have to be him he didn't need to know anybody but that's that's the view of just a black man in distress mm -hmm. right that yeah. caused him to be tased to death right right yeah and this and this is another reason why I like um uh we have to see this as an existential threat to us all because once they started doing this to black and brown people they start doing this to lower class white people too and getting away with it you know what i mean uh it's a case out in uh i want to say uh cross it's out in wisconsin uh a uh, brother named uh uh joshua gomos he was gunned down by the police. It was a white, it's a white brother too. You know what I'm saying? And uh, they tried to say he had a knife in his hand. It was really just his cell phone. They gunned him down uh, with an AR-15, like shot him multiple times right there on camera. It's on YouTube. On my birthday, January 2nd, I posted a, a birthday shout out to his son because being his son has the same birthday. And I, I do that every year to like send my condolences to his mother. Uh, she's been following me for some years and stuff like this. But this is a white, this is a white brother. You know what I'm saying? But because people are not standing up and they, well, they have with George Floyd, but the solidarity of standing up with the black and brown community is essential to also protecting the lower white community from the same type of aggression and same type of repression. Because at the last analysis this is a class struggle and they know that you know what i mean we all expendable to them you know what i'm saying we just looked at it as a bigger threat but this is this residue effect of repression against society spills on to all other demographics in the society you know what i'm saying where indigenous people getting gunned down just because they brown people that they realize is is always been uh one of those narratives that they want to wipe out a, uh, and carry out a genocide against too. So this affects us all. And this is why we all got to stand up against this. Here in Indianapolis, they just killed this brother named Herman Whitfield April last year, the same way his mother called the ambulance. He was having a men mental distress. She called the ambulance. Instead of the ambulance come, six pigs showed up and killed her son. <laughs> They wouldn't even let her go down to the hospital. She had her, and these are older folks, they had to run from the police, jump in their car and get to the hospital, but they was uh, chasing them down and trying to prevent them from even going in there. Then they went in, they, they went in their house without a warrant afterwards, you know what I mean? And that's the case that we're gonna be taking up here in Indianapolis, Boots Underground, uh, MLK Day. But this is why we got to keep on doing what we're doing, people. You know what I'm saying? Once we become conscious of our historical mission, this is what we have to do in order to build and uh, stand up for ourselves because we're the only solution to this problem. You know what I mean? Uh, let me go to Veronica, Johnny Torres, and then the last person is going to be Timco. Uh, and then we'll probably conclude this. I know this is like uh, eight an uh, hour and 40 minutes in. So we'll go to Veronica. Okay, um, so I just wanted to bring up a point um, and, and just briefly here, it kind of takes us um, on, on a different course here, but um, just wanted to make sure to acknowledge this piece here where you talk about um, a lot of my suicidal urges in that regard can be traced back to my religious upbringing. Mm. And, you know, I just didn't want to, 
not touch on that piece there. You know, I think, right. you, you know, that was like the, the final part of the preface, but, um, you know, you, you really use some powerful words here. You know, like when you say, I, all my life, I have been haunted by the ultimate purpose of life. You know, the, the whole significance of life itself. We are put here on this earth only to pass this cosmological test between God and Satan. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, where you kind of walk us through your, your thought process with that. And then you say, again, for me, life had been a true curse, literally and figuratively from the very beginning, ever mm -hmm. since I had been indoctrinated with those teachings from the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I just, I just wanted to, to acknowledge that part. Um, you know, the, the part that really, you know, I think we all, you know, have our conscious of the role that religion you know has has played in in things but the the part that that really resonated with me and I don't know if this was intentional on your part brother but the way you ended it the the preface you said I quietly said my prayer of repentance to myself and closed my eyes and waited for the end mm -hmm. you know and so to me it was just kind of you know ironic it stood out to me because you know you 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 spend a, a good deal of time here talking about uh how it didn't make no sense you know how it was contradictory and such but at the end it was all you had to hold on to in that moment right right you know and so it just makes me think of you know here in, in the present day you know as we're out amongst the people is that um you know a lot of people are still holding on to mm -hmm. religion you know mm -hmm. and so how do we how do we uh, navigate that? How do we bring awareness to things without, uh, you know, bashing or disrespecting and becoming oppressive ourselves as to where people are in their walk? You know, right. if you'd have seen me three years ago, I was a sold out Christian. You couldn't tell me <laughs> nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? I would have I would have thrown the holy water at you and everything else. <laughs> You know, right. but um, so yeah, I just wanted to to acknowledge that piece right there. I don't know if you if you wanted to to add anything to that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm glad because I kind of slipped my mind, and that's probably one of one of the most important aspects. Like you can't understand my life without understanding how I internalized my Christian faith uh, at that time in my life when I believed in Christianity fully, one hundred percent. Like I was just like you. I was a Christian fundamentalist in the sense that I believe 1000%. You know what I'm saying? No disrespect to anyone that's on here that is a religious person, a Christian, whatever. But this is my story. And, uh, and having these conversations will help people understand how uh, things like that can actually negatively affect people. You know, we don't hear those stories. We always hear the, the stories that it was the Christian faith that saved them and now they're a better person. But let's tell the story of how that it, uh, other people internalized it and made them suicidal. <laughs> that helped condition them to prepare them to go out here once they chose the criminal lifestyle, not to care about the consequences of their life or anybody else's life. Uh, let's talk about you know how this was a credit PTSD <laughs> throughout my whole life uh, because I internalized this colonial way of looking at life and my relationship to other people in life and our whole purpose in life. You know what I'm saying? I think for Black uh, uh, people, we have to thank and Indigenous people, Chicano people, uh, how it was used to colonize our lands to enslave our people, you know what I'm saying? And when people fail to recognize that connection of how those things was used as a form of colonial oppression and a tool of dominance and control, then they not being realistic with that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I always ask people, and you're gonna see I'm gonna struggle through with this question throughout my whole book. <laughs> that was one of the things that drove me to read books uh, once I started to actually pick up books and try to answer questions for myself, like I said, I named the book, My Search for Answers, Truth and Meaning. That was one of the biggest searches uh, because of, of my upbringing and how much I believed in it. I wanted answers for that. And it's uh, 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 
ironically, when I uh, go on that path, and we're going to get to that in uh, future chapters, it was some of the stuff I found out by serendipity. It was by uh, mistake. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I think that's going to be ironic because you're going to see, like you said, even though I struggled with this, that was the last thing I could hold on because that's the only thing I knew. You know what I mean? That was the only thing I knew. I had nothing else to hold on to at that point. So even though it was one of those things that caused me internal uh, turmoil throughout my life, it was the last thing I still had to ho uh, hold on to, the hope for a better future if after life I was uh, being presented with going to heaven or hell. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's ironic. But think I want people to think about this especially indigenous people and, and black people that was put in slavery and uh, indigenous people that land was taken from them. Why was the only thing they allowed us to have uh, was the Bible, Word. You know, the Bible, you know what I'm saying? Like that's something that we should really think about. They took everything else from us even everything about our human dignity but they gave us christianity why <laughs> you know what i mean but when you read through the praises and if you if you're a christian ain't read that whole bible hey you need to read that whole bible uh i like i said i was a dedicated person that really read that stuff especially when i went to prison and when i started to read passages about slavery and uh, knew about that even before I went to prison and was raised in that culture. And I was always thinking like, why would God uphold slavery? Like what, what is loving? What is like even human beings today, no human being today will be celebrated and praised for upholding slavery. But right there within their religious text, it upholds it and tells us to be obedient to our slave masters. Yeah, there was a whole civil war to end that stuff here. You know what I'm saying? And people, nobody, not even these imperialists would get on TV today and say anything positive about slavery. But right there in the religious text, uh, it, it talks about we supposed to be upholding uh, the slave master as if just the same way we would uphold the Lord and be obedient. Come on, man. That was giving us, that was inculcating us with a colonial mentality, a slave mentality. And these are things that we need to discuss amongst ourselves if we're gonna be honest about ourselves, if we're gonna overcome some of the things that keep us mentally confined, mentally enslaved, mentally colonized, we're gonna have to talk about these types of things. We can do so in a principled manner, but the way I address this is that we aren't a monolithic people and like I always say all the time, we all woke up at different times of the day today. It's the same way with consciousness. We all wake up at different times in our journey of consciousness. You know what I'm saying? But recognizing that we can be patient with the individuals that are our places where we formerly were. You know what I'm saying? And because we're not a monolithic community, we are Muslims, we're Christian, we're atheists, we're, we're, uh, we're, Hebrew Israelites, we Moors, we Jews, you know what I'm saying? We're uh, uh, street organizations, we vice lords, we GDs, we Bloods, we Crips, we all these different things. So we have to recognize uh, with this Second Rainbow Coalition, this programmatic unity that we have binds us all together, no matter what we believe in. You know what I'm saying? Building these 10 point, putting these 10 point programs into action to resolve and uh, uh, some of the issues and contradictions in our community binds us all together. We all just got done talking about the police brutality, which is 0. 0.7 of the original Black Panther Party 10 point coalition. We all can identify that no matter if we are Christian, a uh, 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 Muslim, a Jew, uh, a Buddhist, an atheist, a GD, a vice lord, a crip, a blood, we are all identified with that. So that binds us together. But within that unity, we have to have struggle. Unity, struggle, op, uh, struggle, uh, struggle, unity is the dialectic of moving the movement forward, where we can have principled discussions amongst ourselves like this and push us forward. And some of us is going to go and start questioning some of these things when we finish reading this book. Because I'm going to unveil how I started to resolve those contradictions where I'm no longer a Christian. You know what I'm saying? I hope I did 
uh, reveal a secret that uh, y'all was wondering. I wonder if it's <laughs> <laughs> But I wanted to be truthful with my journey and show how I even got to the point I am today. You know what I'm saying? When I was a firm believer at one point, you know what I'm saying? But no longer uh, is uphold that way of outlook of life. I look at it as a colonial way of thinking, but that's only because of my level of conscious now. I haven't always believed that. So with individuals that still view uh, their faith as uh, uh, that rock, we, we, we can have principal discussions and di agree to disagree as we uh, have these conversations. And it might challenge you to actually look further into why you even uh, uphold what you um, accept is your way of world outlook. You know what I'm saying? But but also being able to maintain the unity as comrades with each other and then not be a source of division. Uh, so that's the way I approach it with individuals and their conscious journey of uh, uh, searching for answers, truth and meaning. Uh, I think we can do it so in a principled way where we uh, actually develop as comrades in this struggle and gain greater respect for each other in ways we teach each other to challenge ourselves and always question everything. Don't just take my word for it. Don't take Alyssa's word for it. Don't take Veronica's word for it. Don't take Johnny Torres, Lobo. Or don't take our word for it. Do your own research. And you might find something surprisingly that will change your worldview from there on. You know what I mean? Uh, Johnny Torres, and we'll probably let that be the last one. Oh, I think my hand was still up from the last time. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all good, brother. <laughs> okay. I had had my hand raised. Uh, it's Briam Timko. Yep. Go ahead, comrade. Uh, it, when we were talking about the, the different people over the last couple of years who've been injured, just this past year in a, in New Haven, a man named Randy Cox was paralyzed after he'd been apprehended in a police car because the police officer was speeding on his phone and had to slam to avoid getting hit at a red light slam on the brakes. Randy Cox says, like, I can't move in the back seat. He, the police officer goes, OK, I'm going to call an ambulance, proceeds to not wait for an ambulance, goes back to the police station and they tell Randy Cox to get out of the car himself. He, he can't move. His injuries are probably more aggravated at this point. And um, I think they drug him out of the car and, and eventually like put him in a wheelchair as they're making fun of him. There's video. He's okay. still paralyzed, and, and the police, and now the mayor, are saying that it was due to his own personal negligence. And, wow. and it's, it's just pretty infuriating. The NWACP, all these people were here this summer, like, we're going to be with you here the whole time. They were here when the cameras were here, and this man is still paralyzed. Right, right. Yeah. I hate to hear that, man. Uh, the it's this this is what we we definitely got to wrap our minds around and this is the 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 contradiction of it this is how this system actually works <laughs> this is how this capitalist imperialist white supremacist actually works these are actual policies that sanction uh and being sanctioned from the uh this government how it relates to uh the people especially black and brown people but also lower class people in general and the more we wrap our minds around the fact that this is how this system actually works, then we'll start to recognize it's illegitimate. It's an illegitimate system that will never serve our, his, our interests as a people. It will never give us real self-determination. It will never give us real human dignity, self-respect, and liberation of our people. This will always be a feature of this capitalist, imperialist, white supremacist, fascist system. You know what I'm saying? And the more we wrap our heads around it and recognize it's illegitimate, then we recognize we the only ones that can solve this and resolve this contradiction. Once we wrap our head around that is the oppressed people of uh, black, brown, yellow, indigenous, uh, uh, white community, you know what I'm saying? When we come to recognize that consciously, 
then we can understand we are the only ones that can change our conditions. Not the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, not one leader, not one revolutionary. It's going to take the power of the people consciously changing their circumstances and saying we tired of that. You know what I'm saying? This is the secret that they always hidden from us is that we really make history. <laughs> We either accept this shit like we've been doing or we change it once we we not outnumbered. <laughs> we just unorganized. And that's what we got to solve. We got to organize. You know what I'm saying? We got to organize. We got to organize. We got to organize. We got to agitate. We got to agitate. We got to agitate. We got to educate. We got to educate. We got to educate. And once we form that class solidarity of consciousness of the people, of all oppressed people on this plantation, then we'll know who the real slave master is. You dig what I'm saying? And he is not capable of defeating us when we unite the whole plantation of the black, brown, yellow, red, white community. You dig what I'm saying? We are invincible when we unite ourselves and we understand our historical mission for our generation. We cannot be defeated. That is the task that we have at hand. That's what the goal that we're in aims that we all are working towards as we develop this rainbow coalition. So I appreciate that comrade. I'm gonna end with um, uh, Veronica. She wants to make one last statement and we'll conclude this. Uh, this will be uploaded to the YouTube channel after this. Uh, so if you uh, want to send this to someone and let them check it out, you definitely uh, 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 able to. Uh, Thank, you, Veronica. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to, to take this opportunity also to recognize all our political prisoners, all our prisoners of war, as well as all our colonial subjects, all our brothers and sisters that are behind the wall in the belly of the beast and encourage that transformation from that colonized mindset, which you know I, I always try to use that word as opposed to criminal, uh, because I think many times we, we disconnect that point that mm -hmm. the, the criminal mind, as you were, you were saying comrade earlier, we, we didn't learn this shit, you know, that this is in our ways. This, mm -hmm. is, this is not the ways of our people, we're playing y'all's game. So, right you know, transforming that, that colonial mentality, you know, and, and not looking down on our brothers and sisters that are incarcerated because we're all, we're all colonized and complicit with this uh, colonial system in some way, shape or form, you know, but mm -hmm. um, just wanted to take a moment, you know, because I mean, this is your story of transformation. And um, so just wanted to acknowledge them as well and uh, all power to the people. All power to the people. I appreciate that, comrade. And that's a good point. Uh, I'm glad you tied uh, that and replaced it with colonial uh, mind frame. The criminal mind frame is a colonial mind frame. You know what I'm saying? And it, it, it's a, like I said before, it's a reflection of the uh, system that we was all conditioned in. You know, that criminal mentality is a reflection of the criminal mentality of the capitalist imperialist that steals from the whole world. <laughs> like I use that example, we stealing from people right here in our community and uh, oppressing people in our own community. You know what I'm saying? But while they're doing it on a global level, they're taking the resources from whole countries. You know what I mean? They're committing genocide against whole peoples around the world and they calling that spreading freedom and democracy. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Uh, but they really spread capitalist imperialism. They really spread in colonialism. They really expanded their empire and maintaining that hegemony of the world. Just like people in the streets that's doing the same thing, trying to take over blocks and maintain their little criminal enterprise in their community, which is nothing but a reflection of their colonial subjugation and reflecting the same colonial relationship that the capitalist imperialists have over us all. You know what I mean? So this is why when we break free from the criminal mentality, we actually breaking free from the colonial mentality that we internalize from our oppressor. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate you uh, for making that uh, comparison and that distinction of that. Yeah, the criminal mentality really is a colonial mentality and we can replace that 
and by calling in for what it really is. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate that. That was a very uh, poignant point you made, Veronica. Um, and with that said, I'm going to close that uh, this session. Uh, the next session is going to be Sunday, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so definitely uh, invite uh, other ones in the Rainbow Coalition that's a part of your organization. Send this link to people. I'm, uh, we're about to upload the YouTube uh, uh, of this uh, book reading tonight. So y'all can share this with friends, family, comrades, whoever. But uh, yeah. We're going to keep this going, and as this goes, we're going to develop in the, uh, this where uh, we develop the next leaders of this generation. You know what I mean? And I hope my book inspires this generation to some of the other leaders start writing their books, because we need lit literature for our generation to inspire us. It's good that we're about to start reading the literature of the past generation of original elders and stuff, but our generation is going to have to start creating our own literature that's going to inspire our generation, just like the literature back then inspired their generation. You know what I mean? I'm glad to be a part of that. I'm glad I could contribute view to that. I'm glad everyone that came in tuned in with your questions to day and let's keep this going forward comrades all power to the people all power to the people i said all power to the people all power to the people all That's power to the people black and brown power brown. all right you can end that uh uh gabriel